Welcome to the California Book Club. I'm David L. Eulen. I'm the books editor for Alta Journal, and I'm here to introduce tonight's um, program. Before we get started, I want to talk a little bit, uh, tell you a little bit about um, Alta and the California Book Club, in case you don't know. Uh, Alta Journal is a print quarterly with an active uh, web presence covering California and the West, books, culture, um, art, and, uh, and, and, and the social um, landscape of, um, of the region. Um, and we, California Book Club is one of our uh, initiatives. It's a monthly book club um, focusing on the literature of California and particularly the new California canon. Um, we are, uh, we, I wanna also, I wanna, um, excuse me, I wanna, getting too excited, a little ahead of myself. I wanna first thank our partners. We couldn't do this without our partners. Um, that Those partners are Book Passage, Books Inc., Book Soup, Bookshop, Diesel, a bookstore, the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West, the Los Angeles Public Library, the San Francisco Public Library, Narrative Magazine, Ziziva, and Roman's uh, Bookstore. I also want to let you all know we have a sale for California Book Club members. For just $50, you can get a year of Alta Journal, uh, the CBC tote bag. And um, let me show you the CBC tote bag. This is um, a pretty handsome item here. Pockets, Velcro, zippers, everything you want in a tote. Um, and um, one of our upcoming California Book Club books, and I'll talk about that at the end of today to, of the program. We've got an amazing lineup for you um, all through uh, all through the spring. By supporting Alta with a membership, you are helping us to continue to present free events like this, and we really hope you'll consider it. This is a big part of our um, this is a big part of our, our efforts to present these free um, cultural and literary events. Um, please, you can look you can um, sign up for that at altaonline.com/tote, and please watch tomorrow. Thank you email for a link to this great deal. Um, we'll also drop it in the chat right now. Um, so that will be in the chat for you. Uh, we have a ton of great coverage on the Alta site around tonight's author uh, and book, Karen Tayyamashta and her novel, I Hotel. So please visit CaliforniaBookClub.com to read essays and excerpts. Um, and to sort of participate in a in a broad in in, in, a, in the broad conversation around this book. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague John Freeman, who's the host of the California Book Club, who will be um, running the discussion tonight. Um, really looking forward to hearing um, hearing tonight's discussion, John. Thank you, David. Uh, really nice to see everyone piling in. Um, welcome, welcome uh, from Berkeley. Cupertino, uh, Pasadena, and uh, other places all around California and, and the world. Uh, when we set up this club, the idea was to try to focus every month on a different book that um, those of us from California or who live in California or going to California bookstores know very well is or are masterpieces. Um, and one of the books that came up right away was the book we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Karen Tay Yamashita's uh, I Hotel. And Karen has a lot of things to, to her credit um, as, a, as a writer, uh, things that no one else has done. Um, as far as I know, no one else has ever written a novel uh, in the format of a Brazilian soap opera as she did with her first book, Through the Arc of the, Rain, of the Rainforest. Um, no one else has also ever written a novel narrated by an extraterrestrial ball which hovers six inches above the head of her main character as Karen did uh, in her second book. Um, uh, no one else has ever tried to basically combine the formats of travelogue and short story as she did in the Circle K cycle, um, which is just an extraordinary mixture of, of hybrid thinking. Um, and mostly though, the thing that I think really sets Karen Tay Yamashita, apart from almost any other California writer in history, is she's written a great novel about LA and she's written a, written a great novel about San Francisco. Her LA novel, as many of you might know, um, Tropic of Orange is an uncategorizable uh, polyphonic masterpiece, which is full of the sounds and music and the, the, the deep history of Los Angeles told in the perspective of seven characters. Um, that book, uh, I believe, came out in the early 
or sorry, late 1990s, 1997. And I think I understand why there was a gap because when she wrote, went to write her San Francisco novel, it was a little bit bigger uh, and it was probably an un, unknown number of characters, 10 novellas set from 1968, right around the beginning of protests in Berkeley uh, to 1977, when the International Hotel on Kearney Street, uh, which was a low income temporary housing solution for many of the population in that neighborhood who were Filipino and, and other Asian Americans uh, were forcibly evicted. And then the hotel stood empty for years before it was torn down. Karen's used this hotel as a kind of lodestar for a book about the passage of time and history and the development of Asian American identity through interlocking protests and global movements. Uh, and she does this so elegantly across these 10 long pieces, which take up so many different formats. Uh, some are done as dossiers, some are done as uh, Q&As, some are done as fables, fairy tales, some are done as just straight up narration. Um, it's a dazzling performance and it holds together because she very neatly links each section to the next and carries these characters forward in a way that's, that's almost um, uh, beyond conception because the amount of brain space it would take to marshal this many points of detail into one story is just, truly awesome. Um, and the book is about a period of revolution, uh, a hope for revolutionary change. And uh, I wanna bring her on now with just ultimate gratitude for the book and happiness that she could be with us here tonight. Uh, Karen Te Yamashita, please join us. Hello. 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 So, uh, I always want to know what is exactly behind you. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we blurred it out because we didn't fix it up, but it's it's a, our studio. It's a huge room, um, and m much of it is occupied by my husband's art and his uh, his artwork. And he's yeah, and I have this little corner which you can't see, and I'm glad you can't see it. It's really a big mess. Uh, but my Mac is on it and that's what I'm talking to. Do you think visually, I mean, the scale of this book and how it unfolds and how every chapter proceeds uh, with a kind of uh, guide to where it's gonna go, it, it just has a, a such a large scale sense of space. Do you think in arch architectural terms and visual art terms when you are mapping out something at this scale? I tried, I tried to, yeah, I tried to get it to be an architectural project and when I thought of it you know as the hotel I thought it was the architecture of the hotel or that there that each novella would be a room and so I tried to do something with that I actually talked to my husband's architect and he was doing one of those architectural um applications to draw and I, I said could you just teach me that because I think that will help me to write this book <laughs> And uh, he said, are you kidding? <laughs> and uh, so I went away and I, I decided to just make blocks. And that's what I did. So I made these boxes. And you put the stories in the boxes when you delivered it? Well, when I set it up, I thought maybe that would help me to create the stories. So there was an in there were. Well, if you see the boxes, they are on in the the book right they look like this right on the side and um i had i fooled around with those boxes and i had inside of the box and the outside of the box and um i decided how they would be and i cut up construction paper and made them and i set them up on a uh on a coffee table and i thought oh I've, there it is there's that's that's the book um but obviously that wasn't the book. That was just a structure for it. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you started the book, um, as I mentioned, it, it, it begins in 1968 with a, a character's father dies um, and he goes to his father's funeral and the funeral is interrupted because he runs into the, a friend of his father's who's a writer who lived abroad and uh, is, is a, a fan of French literature among other literatures and Chinese literature. 
and it this the, the book begins with a kind of interrupted beginning and then you're you're kind of off and running and a lot of people talk directly to us as readers um, mm. or they're talking to characters and they kind of butt in and start sort of gi giving speeches telling stories I wonder whose voices came first and the loudest uh, because it seems like one of the projects of the book is a kind of a preservation or resurrection of voices. Right, when I, the, the, that first novella took me the longest to write, it took me about a year to write it. And each of the chapters I thought would represent a voice in, in the storytelling. And I had to find what those voices might be. So I made decisions about what that would be, but I had to take the story of the novella and then divided along those lines. Um, and yeah, so let's see, if I look at it now, um, I thought that actually that first, that first novella was really the point of view. And so I was giving you the perspectives of 10 different perspectives of what uh, would be the vision for the different uh, voices and when I knew what which each of the voices were, um, then I could finish the book. Um, How do you, you, you trained as a playwright, right? Um, a long time ago? I wouldn't say I was trained, I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that helped because I had to hear actors read my words and interpret them. And uh, I often thought, that the way in which they interpreted what I wrote for them to say was more interesting than what I had written. And uh, then I would write toward their voices and, uh, and the characters that they were developing from those voices. Um, so I began to understand what that give and take might be. I think other, other playwrights have a very more strict idea about what their characters should be saying. And I, I never did. Mm -hmm. Do you think history travels in our voices and the way we talk and what we, we say to one another? I mean, the, the, the challenge of this book and its triumph is the fact that you amazingly have characters transmitting really important parts of history through the voice, through storytelling. And typically, you know, if, if, uh, if you were to take any writing class or any screenplay writing class, it's like, no, no exposition and dialogue. And yet all of your characters are sort of telling their histories. And I, I, I wonder how you feel like you were able to accomplish that and what, what ways that you, you had to kind of bend the typical laws of the novel in order to allow your characters to speak their histories. Hmm. I, I want to, you know, when I created the narrative voices, I needed to create voices that uh, I could handle, but also had s enough of a humor or a s some kind of satire in the voice that, so that it could talk back to itself. And because um, so many of the people who, with whom I had conversations wanted to also think about what had happened and they, they had, they had dark visions or satiric or ironic visions of what had happened. So I needed, a, needed voices that were, uh, would complement that kind of storytelling. So, um, and I would say that they're all constructions. They're not, when I finally figured out what they were, I had to have rules for them and stay within those rules. So um, that also happened. They're not, they're not real. They're, they're made for a purpose. They were made for a purpose, I guess I would say. Mm. And yet they had to reflect the time period and the voice voices of um, the 60s and 70s. Uh, so I spent, yeah, I, I had to spend a lot of time with the, the yeah, writing in that period, reading a lot of work, and then also just talking to folks. Mm. Were you living in the Bay Area in the, in the late 60s and early 70s? No, no. You know, I'm from L.A. And uh, I was born in Oakland. 
And so my, my, my parents, both sides of their family are from the Bay Area. And so every summer I was there with my cousins. But in those years, I was actually in Minnesota. I went to Scott Carlton. And uh, so I was thrust in the middle of this snowy place for much of the year before those four years and one of the years also i was um in japan so uh, i was here and not here i would come back in the summers and work in the summers in in la um and uh, i thought actually that the story was going to be set in los angeles but in in 1997 i got a job at uc santa cruz and i realized that i wanted to revisit you know where i was born oakland my family here and i i took on this project here in the bay area because i wanted to revisit san francisco and then it turned out that i i really discovered that the story belonged in the bay area and uh and it was a much tighter story and the story could be focused um at some point, I figured that the uh, the hotel was the center of the story. Mm. Mm. There's so many different places. I mean, we'll come back to the hotel and and your method of research because I, in a little bit, we'll bring on Professor uh, Diane uh, Fugino, who's an Asian American studies uh, professor at uh, UC Santa Barbara, who's going to ask you about your research. Um, but I'm I'm curious because th there are these other load stars. Um, you know, there's there's there, there's Berkeley and San Francisco State, you know, who are who play big parts in this in this novel as a kind of institutions. Uh, there's um, Angel Island, you know. Uh, there's Alcatraz. There, there's these sort of in between places where people are kept uh, and have to stay. And um, you know, a, a lot of these places are in the book. They're 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 places which are occupied and where people can't get out to some degree. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because it, it lends a very sprawling novel, a, a feeling of um, not claustrophobia, but, um, but of imprisonment, you know, of people wanting to liberate and get free. And I, I, I wonder if you deliberately were thinking of kind of spaces people couldn't get out of. Hmm. Well, certainly, the, the big story is really about redevelopment and the taking over the city and how the city um, was occupied actually by different forces, but that the people who wanted to stay um, and the people who were forced to leave. Um, and so I really had to think about urban development and why that had happened. And for example, with uh, Japantown, Japantown was part of the Fillmore and that district was really gutted. And it was it was labeled as what do we what was the label in those days? Um mm, what? Did they even call it urban blight? Yeah, urban blight. So it was so and so then these people were bought out and, and these areas were completely ravaged and people lost their homes, uh, especially if they were renters. Not the people who owned, they, they never lost anything, but the people who didn't uh, lost their place and they had to leave the city or they had to find other places. And we know that this is a continuing story about San Francisco and uh, it's the reason for um, high prices and uh, hard to find housing and uh, the huge homeless population we have in the city. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it starts there, but oh, and uh, then on the other side of it, so these were, there were Chinatown and Nihonmachi or Japantown, and these were places where we were forced to live, but then, and couldn't leave, and then, then places that were cleared out, and we were forced, then we were forced to leave again, um, and, and then there was, of course, the story for my parents, where they were incarcerated during the war and they had to leave. So they left, from, that was true of my, my mother's family, left uh, Japantown and they were sent to Topaz and they lived there during the war mm -hmm. until they returned in after the war. So all these stories of 
this this sort of movement um and it, it definitely radicalized the the asian population that history mm. Mm. The, and and the history which precedes the history that you're writing about is talking talking to the present in this book constantly and there's a powerful passage that i think maybe you could read from in which uh the characters discover poems written on the wall uh you know of of where they had to stay while waiting for uh legal access into the city once they were um, immigrate, immigrating into San Francisco. So you want me to read, but what is, is that is that what we had decided? Is that still page 58? <laughs> um, actually, or you could, uh, you or know, you, did you find someplace else? I think the, the place page 58 was great. Um, All right. That's yeah. Okay. This is this is from um, chapter five. Uh, we. When we arrived, there was no Golden Gate, no Statue of Liberty. Even so, some shouted, America, America. And we floated into the bay like the fog at twilight. If we got there earlier than the great earthquake and fire, our first impressions of our golden city were on the Barbary coast. Loose men and women in of the vintage gay 90s carousing in dance halls and bars around and about in horse-drawn buggies, speculating on a future and fortunes made from California gold. If we arrived after the fire, some of us might have noticed the island of Alcatraz, but we were forced to dock at another prison island, the one called Angel. In those early years, the Bay's geography was traversed by ferries fanning out from the city's great transportation hub, the, the ferry building. We ourselves fanned out across the peninsulas, congregating in cities segregated by covenants, in farmlands confined by land laws and leasing contracts, on coastal waters in small fishing boats. We worked as houseboys, cooks, pickers, and stoop laborers, gardeners, fishermen, and canners. We opened shops, groceries, dry goods, tailoring, restaurants, flower shops, drugstores with soda fountains. We ran boarding houses and hotels, churches, temples, newspapers, health clinics, language schools, YMCAs and YWCAs and Kenjin Kais. We gave our adopted towns names like Little Yokohama and Nihon Machi. By the third decade of the century, our children witnessed the great engineering feats and the openings of the stately Golden Gate and bay bridges, cable cars, and automobiles replaced horses and ferry boats. We sent our children to school and college only to see them return home jobless. Those were the days when you'd meet a fellow with an engineering degree selling fruit on the corner. Everything changed with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. We were forced to leave our little towns and farming and fishing communities and were herded en masse to desert camps surrounded by barbed wire and gun towers. We look like the enemy, but that's not the same as being the enemy. At war's end, those of us who survived came back to our golden city and our little towns, took up our old jobs or started new ones. We rebuilt our old communities and started new families. Our youngsters turned into the third generation, what we call the Sansei, and that's about the time when this story begins. Who's to say what love is or how it starts inside each person? Who's to say what triggers the feeling? The knowing that passes from one to the other. We saw the young man walk through the tattered remains of the old ferry building. Maybe it was the old building with its ghost lovers. We can't say. We could see his footfalls avoid the scraps of trash ground into the grimy crevices. Maybe it was the decay of an old place. He was wearing gold alligator cowboy boots. We could see them shuffling out from his ragged bells, scuffed and shredding at the toe. We could tell that those boots were his favorite, snug in the right places, his walk confident. Oh, I love that passage. 
Over. Especially because you move so so neatly from a first person plural, sort of above the the body of the figure, and then into his, you know, looking at his clothes, his walk, and then eventually inhabiting him. You know, in the, in the beginning, we the the character we were speaking about, who goes to the uh, his father dies, Paul Wallace Lynn, um, it, and he he develops this uh, kind of mentor slash fatherly relationship. With, a, with an older uh, Chinese American man. And, um, you know, I, a, parts of the book feel um, like it's an Asian American savage detectives. You know, it's like people <laughs> sitting at cafes talking <laughs> about poets yeah. and, and yeah. people yeah. translating and love. And there's a lot of scrounging in bookstores, pulling forward, you know, uh, writers from the past who have been neglected. And I, I wonder if you could talk about sort of how this book is a is a tribute to Asian American writing before you, as well as it's sort of yoking forward what those writers did. Yeah, definitely, you're right. You're right about that. I, I spend a great deal of time talking to um, the writers who were involved in that in at that in this period, and thinking about. Uh, asking them questions about how it all started because we really didn't have something we want we could call an Asian American literature in those years. I mean, we had it, but no one had named it. And uh, so there was this movement among young writers to find um, the writers before to say, look, we have this history, we have these, we have these writers who have come before. And so there was Toshio Mori and Wakako Yamauchi and Hisai Yamamoto. And uh, these writers and their short stories were published willy nilly in newspapers and uh, local, local, um, local journals and that sort of thing. And so all of this writing was rediscovered and taken together. And um, there were groups of people who started to create anthologies. And so these are my characters who are trying to find a place in a literary history and story and to find their own stories in themselves in, in American history. Um, and yeah, that was very important. I, I wanted make, to make sure that that story was there. So, but it wasn't just that. There was, there was kind of an artistic renaissance going on at this time, right? I mean, there were people making comic books and silk screens and, uh, they were doing art and uh, filmmaking. Um, everyone was making things. They were they were doing things on stage. They discovered how to make films and um, documentaries. And I realized that it was more than just sort of a literary a literary movement. It was, you know, a general artistic explosion of all these things that people wanted to do and be and participate in. And uh, so that became part of the book. I wanted it there. Um, and then, of course, there, there is all this, the political underground and the, the collectives, um, the rethinking of, of communist thinking, and then um, how that moved into making people work um, in unions and, and get into factories and to work in Chinatown. Uh, with the garment industry, uh, with the electronics, um, all of those things, people found their spaces and their um, their necessary um, what they felt they had to do, because this was a moment. This was a moment in time that people felt that they could change uh, the way we lived. Well, the, one of the thrilling aspects of reading the book is just watching. Uh, uh, Black characters, Latinx characters, indigenous characters, you know, Cambodian American, Laotian American, Chinese, Japanese American, people who are all have a, an essentially liberationist um, uh, political agenda intersecting and overlapping and, and sometimes being adjacent without realizing th that they have similar goals. I want to bring on at this point Diane Fugino, the um, professor of Asian American studies at UC Santa Barbara, because her area of specialty is, in fact, this very moment of, of sort of the intersection of, of Asian American and, and 
African American political um, radical life in the 1940s up to the 1960s and beyond. And and Diane, I wonder if you could ask some questions of of Karen. Yeah, thank you so much, John and Karen. Um, Really wonderful to see you. And I think I am going to start with these words that Jessica Hagedorn, right, the great Filipino writer, said about your book, I Hotel. She said, big, bold, beast of a book, <laughs> genre defying, trippy, brilliant. <laughs> and I'd have to agree with all of that. <laughs> um, I want to say, you know, I, I entered this conversation with you, right, as a scholar of Asian American activism, and I'm also completely intrigued with that period of the Asian American movement of the 60s and 70s. Um, and I'm thinking about what it means to write fiction versus nonfiction, right, the kind of work that you do versus the kind of work I do, when we use somewhat similar methods right, interviews, archival research, and your research was massive, like 10 years. And I remember we sat and talked at that time. And you know, we right, were crossing paths all the time. <laughs> except I never interviewed 150 people, or you wouldn't even call them interviews, you would call them conversations. conversations. So you had a little different approach um, than say, you know, somebody who, you know, like, like me. But, you know, I'm really struck with how important it was for you to do all of that research and how important it was for you to use names and organizations that actually existed, right? Some of these Asian American political organizations, public figures, events that actually happened. And at the same time, of course, you're using fictional names, right? And one of the ones I love, right, is Taka Bayashi, right? This <laughs> blending, which you're not saying, but it's very clear to those who know, right? <laughs> two professors, right, Paul Takagi and James Hirabayashi, who were really important to the Asian American movement at Berkeley and San Francisco State. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about why you chose this approach that was both fictional as you do so beautifully, but that historical resonance and all of this deep research mattered to you. Yeah, absolutely. It mattered. And I, Well, all right. There, there are a number of things going on here. First of all, I was I was having conversations with many people who were involved in the movement at the time, and uh, I think you might know, you know this, that at the time that we were doing this, um, this research, people were afraid to talk to us. Mm. And I've, 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 I sense that they were really doubtful that, um, that I would do the work and that I would tell the story as they they saw it, or, or and um, they didn't, you know, and and I understood what was going on there. So I I felt really that I owed it to the people I spoke with and re and whose stories I researched that I that I really did know the background as deeply as I could possibly know it. At the same time, there were so many gaps. And as, as a historian scholar, you cannot imagine what those things were, but I could. And I think that maybe that's where we part ways, where I, I fill in the gaps or I, I make fun of things or I give voices to that don't exist. Where I, in, in many of the cases, you're, you're, you're talking about um, your Bayashi and Takagi, and that I merged their stories, and they made them one character. It's a character that does not exist; it's a fictional character, but their stories uh, live together. And I, I couldn't in, in telling this. I had too many characters for one thing, <laughs> so there was something practical that I had to do about it. Um, but I also felt that their stories had to be there. So how how would I do that? Um, I think that fiction can do the work of thinking in ways that um, are not available to the academic scholar and historian, because I can um, suggest uh, possibilities for what might have gone through people's heads or what might have happened. Um, I'm not sure. Um, so, 
And I think that's useful. I think that um, having that ability is also useful. It's it's a kind of theory, theorizing behind the scenes. It's the underpinning of um, what might have happened. Um, and not, so I, I know it's fiction, and I know what I did was uh, that, but it's not as if it's not true. Um, yeah. I think it's a hard thing to talk about. You know, I think some of what you do that's so important in this book, right? Well, there's so much, but one of the things is you tell the stories of things that have happened in Japanese, Chinese, Filipino America, stories that often aren't told, right? I, I say that until really COVID in Atlanta, right? Asian America remains so invisible and you told <laughs> all kinds of stories of people's hopes and dreams and, and and the deaths right that some of those deaths stay with me and yet they were really happening right overdoses and things like this so I, I think that's such important work and and I want to um you know I I you wrote this as a Japanese American right I'm reading this as a Japanese American and yet it is definitely a pan-Asian story it's a story of the Asian American movement and I was wondering if you faced any kinds of tensions as you were writing this, like worries that you were overrepresenting Japanese America, worries that you might be misrepresenting Chinese or Filipino America, this kind of thing. And I loved it because it, I loved the, I, and I found myself really attending to the Japanese American things that really resonate for me. <laughs> yes, of course. You know, I, I think I, um... When I was younger as a writer, I, and of, of course, when I was younger as a writer, I didn't write about Asian America. I, I didn't. I wrote about Japanese in Brazil. And um, yeah, I, I, maybe at that moment, I, I, I felt that I became um, acquainted with so many um, stories and people. And I have to thank them for allowing me into their lives and their homes and 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 telling me those stories and i so i i felt that i had uh i had to honor them uh at the same time yeah i i was worried about getting it right and so the there are sections um that for example the the funeral in the first section the chinese fu funeral I spent a long time talking to Judy Young and having her read it and tell me and, uh, and say, okay, where, what, what's happening here and what's going to happen? And so she really, she really took me through that, that space and said, okay, this, this is what's gonna happen. They're gonna go into the house and they have to shoo out the ghost and they'll come back and they're going to all these places that this man um, knew and lived. Uh, and, but they have to shoo his ghost out and they have to make sure that he's uh, properly um, gifted with the end of his life. So those were things that I wanted to attend to. Um, and there were other pieces of it in which I asked the people with whom I had um, interviewed, not interview, but had conversations with, I asked them to read the sections where I thought that I might have screwed up. And I asked them to take a look, please tell me, tell me if what doesn't feel right. Um, and what was interesting is they they actually added things. <laughs> so I had to go back and write more. But that was uh, so that that yeah, I I I I asked them to participate in, in my writing. And I think that was important to me. And uh, was important that we shared that, but who knows? Maybe they're still ma they're mad at me anyway. <laughs> I haven't heard. Hey, people, uh, Asian Americans are very polite. <laughs> <laughs> I think that from what I've heard, people are just so delighted and thrilled with with this, and and think it's such an important work that you that you've put out. So thank you. And I think my time is up, so I need to invite John back. Up. Thank you. We'll bring uh, Diane back in a little bit. Um, 
Karen, it's, it's, it's been interesting hearing you talk about the fact that you're, this novel is so based on interviews and, and conversations and, you know, in, a, in another format, when Diane and I were speaking, she, she mentioned that you, you didn't take notes in your interviews or record them, you, you had a conversation. And I wonder, you know, your earlier book, Brazil Maru, which is based on Japanese um, immigrants coming to Brazil to set up a utopia, which you, 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 you um, interviewed lots of people in Sao Paulo and other parts of Brazil to write that book. And I, I wonder if you learned anything in those interviews that you took to the interviews you were doing for iHotel. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I, when I started, I, I had a recorder and I was recording people and I thought, oh, and get this, you know, I was speaking to them in Japanese and Portuguese. And sometimes I would miss something in the Japanese or the Portuguese and I think, oh, it's on tape. Um, I can always go back and I'll, I'll figure it out. And I would go back to the tape and I could never transcribe that thing. So I realized that what I had had to do was to stop the interview and say, please explain to me what you're saying. I'm, I need a translation. Um, and then I began my work um, in Brazil um, interviewing Japanese women, and they were, you know, I was, so that it, it was very important to me that I got the women's, these women's stories. Then I would go to their houses and then they would serve me tea and that sort of thing. And then at some point when they served me the tea, they would, some man would appear and he would have tea with us and the cake or whatever it was. And, and I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh, I, I got to turn off the, the tape recorder. The guy's here, I, this is gonna mess it up. But what it turned out to be true for me was that I needed to hear what he had to say because say this was a couple, the woman did the woman's work, but he, he managed the money, he bought the land, he, he bought the materials, he knew when they moved. Um, he knew all the kinds of things that I needed to know about the sort of the, the social integration of these families, which had, and, and, and yes, she knew about the home and her family and that sort of thing, but I, I realized I couldn't get the full picture. The other thing that happened with um, the, the I Hotel in particular is that people did not want to talk to me if I recorded them. And very often people who, people had done things that they didn't want others to know, um, but they were happy to tell the stories of them, but they didn't want it to be recorded. One man told me, he said, you know, you're not recording this, so I'm gonna tell you. And I realized that I, I just had to memorize what they said. Hmm. Um, so I, I, I had to learn to listen very, very carefully. And I would, I would run away from, um, these, these interviews and just dump everything into these files and write and write and write and try to remember everything that that person had said and then kind of reorganize it into stories. Um, I wonder if you've ever read um, Svetlana Alexeyevich, uh, the, the uh, Belarusian Nobel Prize winner. She wrote a, a, a book about, she's basically writing a kind of linked series of oral history like novels um, she calls them cathedrals of history and and she goes into people's homes and collects their stories and in a she had a recent book that was translated called uh, the womanly face of war and it was primarily a book about um uh women who had come who had fought in world war ii for the russian army and she described going into their houses and listening to them and staying with them, and eventually a man would appear, and and it, almost <laughs> verbatim her story about how she had to collect these stories was was very similar, similar to yours. Uh, and I I wonder, you know, did you talk to Black Panthers um, in the course of doing some research for this, or um, or were you talking more to people who are involved with Yellow Power? And do you want to explain how those two worlds connected for any of the listeners who? Um, aren't familiar with with that. All right, so Diane will remember this because I would meet her and she would be um, interviewing Richard Aoki, who was a Panther. And uh, then I would 
go hang out with him at for lunch and just listen to him tell me stories and so his voice is pretty clearly there i think people recognize it um and they all everyone thinks that that's him but it's not <laughs> um so yeah so those stories came through him um and others other uh both women and men who had relationships with um the panthers and uh it this all of these things were happening at the same time the panthers in oakland the um the you know the 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 indian movement on the alcatraz and it was porous in many ways and all of these groups were meeting each other and supporting um each other um fighting and and having their own their disputes and then reorganizing in these um uh, political collectives and uh so i i was very aware that that this could not be a story that was um, just about Asians, and it couldn't be isolated in any way. And of course, the Asian population is a very diverse group. It's they're Filipinos, they're Koreans, they're uh, Japanese, they're Chinese, and mm -hmm. and I wanted to also sort of explode that idea that they were all separate and that they were all balkanized, which later they became, but not 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 in the beginning. This was really a, a pan-ethnic movement, and, uh, and it was also, I think, um, global or international. So then, for me, the International Hotel had that resonance as well. It, it was an international place mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Um, there, there's, a, there's a spiritual element to this book because, you know, I Hotel is the title there's so many different resonances to the word I. There's I myself. There's I, all these individual experiences through a time of history. There's the I watching it. There's people being surveilled. And then there's the body as this hotel for a spirit that it, that passes through it. And there's a spiritual element to this book that does, isn't, in, in my experience of reading about it, that much talked about. And I, I wonder if you could if you could talk about that here because a lot of characters live and die in front of us in this book and we watch them kind of we watch the transmogrification of several souls and across this book and i wonder why that was important to you uh, to to bring that into this time period uh, in the way that you do hmm. i think there's i think probably for me there yeah the ghosts there because by the time um, I, I, I was talking to people, especially about the I Hotel and the, the Manangs who lived there, um, they had all died. And my father was dead. Uh, my mother was very old. Um, and when, by the time the book was actually published, Al Robles had died, Bill Sorrells had died, many of the people that I had interviewed also, Richard had died. Um, They're gone, and so I think there is something of an urgency to um, get their stories and to write about them. Um, so maybe, maybe that's what's what is being sensed there. Uh, 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 Grace um, Grace Wing Yon Toy from the audience asks. Uh, I wonder if it's also a play on the word I, which is love in Chinese and Japanese. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that. Yeah. But that okay. uh, the I hotel, that I is, yeah, it's full of sex. <laughs> I, had lot, I had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> There's some pretty extraordinary sex scenes in the book. Um, <laughs> and, and you threatened to possibly read one for the second reading. Do you, do you feel like doing that or, or do you want to? Um, take more questions um or do you want to read something <laughs> more more pg, PG i don't know well wait a second where is that oh i don't know i, well, I have to think about that <laughs> yeah, you have to tell me where it is <laughs> <laughs> well the, as you look there's some other comments in the in the okay in the, in the questions in the in the question queue 
one comes back to what um, Diane brought up, which is, you know, in this time of a, a pandemic of violence against Asian American women in particular, um, you know, is there something that you want generations of younger Asian Americans to to feel in this book, to take comfort from, or to see, or to feel part of? I think at the time that I was writing it, I think there was an, another generation of Asian Americans who were trying to look at this past and to see what it meant and to reopen that history and legacy. I, and uh, But now when I look at it, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I feel that um, uh, yeah, I, I feel that we have a long history of hatred and that, uh, that is still there. It, that's, that's why it's so hard. So Ooh. looking back at this, I thought, oh, this could be celebratory in some ways about, uh, about a group of people who sacrifice their youth for for change but every generation has had to do this and uh we keep making the same mistakes um and not that not that this is not not that <laughs> that this is telling you how not to make them but we do keep making them don't we yeah but and and the challenges are 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 they're more and more difficult so i i can see that we need an uh another generation who's much more savvy i don't know what we need i wonder if diane if you could come back in um since we're talking in this space i, I suspect that you had a, another question or two that you could bring in at this point um while well, i look furiously for sex scenes in this book like it's a harold <laughs> robbins book <laughs> yeah well, well i will come in right at this point right yesterday was the one year anniversary of atlanta right so i, I and I'm, I'm you know so, so what you're talking about karen like the difficulties of this moment um when john asked about the spirit that's kind of felt throughout the book and I was thinking, well, yeah, this was the I Hotel, right? There was a lot of joy and community, but it was difficult, right? The spaces were small, and then and then the community got demolished. And you end, right, with the demolition, or, or not the dem the, the eviction, right? The eviction of the hotel. Right. And so it's clearly not a happy ending, and it's not a hopeful ending, right? And, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, if this was a, it, you know, to, to what extent this is just where you decided to end it because it was such an important moment. And some people think of the Asian American movement, this the ending of one important phase, right? Um, because not only were there residents who got evicted, but also all those Asian American movement orgs that were in the storefronts. Mm -hmm. Or if this was more literary, like you did not want to create a happy ending. Right? You want people to wrestle with that. I'm wondering if you could speak to this and the way that you ended the book. Well, I knew it was going to end with the eviction. And, uh, but then I, I set that last novella um, as a, as a we, we, um, we voice. And so there are various um, collective voices that speak uh, through that um, last book, and uh, uh, I think that maybe that's the most positive thing that can be said, is that people came together and there is a collective voice, um, and people tried to do something together, I would say. So yes, it, it's, it's a sad ending, isn't it? Um, but when you think about the, the Asian American movement and those years, the things that were created, there were healthcare units that were created, there were 
there were political groups, there were, I mean, people were politicized in ways. Um, ethnic studies started, it was not easy. Um, and it was a difficult birthing all the way, and it's still been difficult, right? So many things happen. The institutions um, that we think of as just being there, um, um, film institutions, um, health institutions, um, they're there because uh, that was a period of time when folks came together to 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 create them. So it's not that nothing happened. I mean, uh, that, that we failed. I, things are there, and 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 then and they're important to us, and they're the structures on which we 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 depend on them. Yeah. I just want to say this really quickly. Harvey Dong, Richard Aoki talked about how he thought he knew it's when you're fighting anti-gentrification struggles, you can't win, right? The property rights struggles. And he thought it was a total failure. And then Harvey Dong said, no, there's a whole infrastructure, there's relationships, there's ways we build out. And so he became convinced otherwise. I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, I'm turning to John. <laughs> yes. Um, there's some more questions, uh, so we can con continue to talk about uh, demolition. Cynthia Yi has a question. Our close-knit communities of color always seem to get demolished and the people evicted. Why is that, do you suppose? The same thing happened in Boston. Why does it happen? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I think it's particular to each each event, is is it not? Although, what happens, I think, uh, is that people fight among each other, and so they and they have disagreements about which direction um, an organization or an event should take, and it's it's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to come to some kinds of agreements. Yeah. One of the things I, there's so many things I love about this book, but it, um, I also teach writing and a lot of my students, I think were despairing because they were going to a lot of protests and then figuring, struggling to figure out how to, how to write about that in their work. You know, how do you write a pro, how do you write about uh, liberation uh, as a, as a movement within a story? Um, and you figure out a way to do that, and and you figure out a way how to describe um, the creative aspects, the kind of thrill of that time, you've, and its anguishes. And of course, one part of that, um, and now I'm going to return it back to the drop thread, is uh, is sex, um, <laughs> sex in the I Hotel, uh, which, is, which is, and I I found the passage that I think you might be thinking of because it is also the only passage in which people have. Um, uh, interest uh, have a kind of they get down and get boogieing on top of Marx <laughs> and very other various <laughs> other Marxist thinkers. Okay. And it's page. It's when Stoney and I go get together at five fifty eight. Um, <laughs> and Stoney knocks on Ayako's door, and she's wearing a mouth jacket and cap and holding a shotgun. And I think, <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> um, I'm I'm working by the way, uh, Karen from this version. The, All right, the, but the, actually, the 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 pages are the same. I think. Uh, all right, here it is. Stony knocks on Aiko's door. She's wearing a mild jacket and cap and holding a shotgun extended across the back of her neck. Behind her, the speaker system swells with orchestral strings. Traditional zithers, triumphant horns, rolling cymbals, and the marching drums of the red detachment of women. Stony could wear the Stony could swear the whole room is glowing and pulsing red, that the entire cherubic yellow nation is welcoming, welcoming him home. His chest pounds with the pride of eight hundred million people. You're late, she says. Never too late for the revolution. 
She smiles and turns. Of course, she's barefoot, and he follows her jaunty step, watches her pull the shotgun to her shoulder, focus on an unseen target, practice her stance. She cocks the 12 gauge and gently pushes it under the bed. She tugs his jacket, packed with her letters stuffed into every pocket, the most precious held next to his heart. She pulls them out and reads one or two, hands grazing his pounding chest, glancing at his lips that read back the parts he's memorized. His eyes fill with tears and longing. Once a revolutionary, his lips form the words. Her fingers find his lips, circle and touch his teeth. Now a comrade. She pushes her hands into the warmth of his jacket, padding thickly with all its paper, stamps, pen confessions, everything has been said. He pulls away her cap, her lustrous hair falling, pops open one by one the frog ties of her mouth's jacket. Beneath, she's, he's surprised to discover she's clothed in a second layer, a thin silk red pajama. Her revolutionary cast of accompanying dancers fly by with red ribbons, and she smiles. This begins in stages, touching through scarlet la it layers, reaching within, feeling, exchanging soft, then wetter kisses, choo, choo, ha, ha, mm, mm. Time to put the shunga and its big promises on the bed, 12 pages of 12 months, turning fragrant pine over pristine snow to fluttering, fading cherry blossoms, to erect Murasaki irises, to plump yellow chrysanthemums and crimson maples. Detachment's red thunder fills the room in powerful splendor, a symphony in four movements. Bodies roll and twist and turn, impossible contortions grow dizzy with the visions of postered faces plastered to every wall. Mao to Marx, to Ho, to Lumumba, to Lenin, to Fidel, to Malcolm, to Che, zapping around and around all the revolutionary men, hard with anticipation. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that's fabulous it's a great place to end yet another definition of i <laughs> <laughs> oh i feel like i could talk to you for quite a bit more and i'm sure everyone here could 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 participate but you've been very generous to give us this much time and to come on and talk about this book and your work and i suspect you'll be on again talking about la yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> If we keep going, because uh, Trop Tropic of Orange is another one of many of our favorite books. Um, but uh, thank you for this and for this book and for coming on. And please, um, if you're in the audience, uh, this this is a, a marvel and um, something that speaks into our time and back into it. So it's it's a it's a revolutionary act of love, um, and that's very hard to pull off. Thank you for that. Thank you, John. Thank, and thanks for writing your review. I just read it. It's, it's very well, special. It's one, one of the nice things about this club is the chance to get together and think and have other pieces and interviews and bring on people like Diane. Thank you, Diane, for coming. Um, and to, uh, you know, give, give, a, give, a, give a part of our life and our evening to looking at something beautiful, uh, which is... <laughs> You know, doesn't happen very often um, when you start the evening with the news these days. Um, so, um, I think at this point, David Yulin is going to come on and and talk talk more about um, what's coming up and where you can go to find more about California Book Club and and Alta. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, Karen. Thanks, Diane. That was a wonderful conversation. This book is a masterpiece. I just want to reiterate that if you haven't read it and you're in the audience, read it, please. It's it's mind blowing um, and and spectacular, and that uh, just like the conversation we just heard. Um, so I want to again thank <clears throat> Karen, Diane, and John. I want to remind you all that this interview has been recorded and will be posted at CaliforniaBookClub.com um, in case you want to revisit it. I want to also uh, remind everyone that next month's book, 
Uh, we will um, be hosting Michael Connolly for his novel, The Dark Hours. That is on April 21st. And also really just to put a buzz in all of your ears for the whole spring program, um, after uh, Michael's book in April, Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts will be the May book and Steph Cha's uh, Your House Will Pay is the June book. That is just about, um, you know, we I just, it's a great lineup. So please come to all of those events. Um, the sale on the Alta membership for California Book Club members, you can find out more about that at altaonline.com slash tote. And please participate in a two minute survey that will pop up as soon as we end this event. Um, in the meantime, stay safe, everybody. See you next month. Take care. Have a good night. And thank you all for being here.